all obstruent consonants have an aperiodic sound source and maybe also a periodic one. The aperiodic sound source is affected by the resonating cavity in front of the sound source, meaning between the sound source and the lips where the sound emerges from the mouth. If a periodic sound source is present, it's affected by the entire vocal tract. If there's a periodic sound source, you should generally see a voice bar, though often that voicing does die out in the middle of something like a voiced fricative. And they should see formants, but they may be somewhat blurred by the air periodic noise of the sound, or may be too low in amplitude to show distinctly. Fricative sounds are produced by forcing air through a narrow constriction in the vocal tract, creating a turbulent air stream, which is an aperiodic noise source. The frequency of the loudest part of the fricative noise depends on the shape of the vocal tract in front of the constriction. That peak will be around 2500 hertz for palatal fricatives like sh and j. It will be 4000 hertz or higher for alveolar fricatives like s and z. In the case of the other fricatives f, v, th, and th, there is often no obvious concentration, and in fact the amplitude isn't very loud. The combination of voicing and frication is hard to create at the same time. In order to have voicing, there needs to be subglottal air pressure to make phonation happen. Fr frication also requires an air pressure buildup behind the constriction. That air pressure buildup causes air pressure above the glottis to increase, and so it's difficult for the subglottal air pressure to be higher than the air pressure above the glottis. The amplitude of frication noise in voiced fricatives is usually lower than it is for comparable voiced fricatives. Sorry, for comparable voiceless fricatives. And the voiced fricatives also tend to be shorter in duration. Here we have four fricative consonants sandwiched by ah uh, vowels, and they have um, s and z, followed by sh and j, or the reverse with sh and j first, followed by s and z. If we look at the fricative portion and the concentration of noise energy, the first two uh, productions have a mid-frequency noise peak that's not visible in the second two productions. We can also see a relatively continuous voice bar in the second and fourth productions that are the voiced fricatives. The mid-frequency uh, fricative noise in the first two productions uh, shows us that we have the palatal fricatives first, followed by the alveolar fricatives second. Here we have the um, other fricatives that are not so loud, sometimes called non-strident fricatives, to differentiate them from the strident ones, the palatals and the alveolars. Uh, in this case, uh, the question doesn't differentiate place of articulation for these fricatives, which is pretty difficult to determine, but instead uh, is about the sequence of voicing. Do we have voiceless voiced, voiceless voiced, or do we have voiced voiceless, voiced voiceless? This is not the uh, easiest thing to identify. But in theory, uh, if we have a voiceless fricative, there should be a somewhat abrupt drop-off of the voice bar, whereas for the voiced fricative, it should look somewhat more continuous. The distinctions are minor, but in the first and third cases, uh, there is a more abrupt transition from periodicity to a lack of periodicity, uh, whereas in the second and fourth cases, things are a little bit blurrier and or we see uh, more of a continuation of formants into the fricative noise rather than them abruptly cutting off. Here we have a monosyllabic word uh, that starts with a fricative consonant. If we look at the acoustics of this fricative consonant, it has an energy concentration in the mid-frequency range and also no evidence of periodicity or a voice bar. 
So among our four choices here, the voiceless palatal fricative, the sh, seems like our best option. The articulation of fricative consonants depends on the place. For the palatal fricatives, the styloglossus posterior transverse muscles and inferior longitudinal muscle um, help uh, pull the tongue blade up toward the uh, hard palate while keeping the tongue tip from touching the alveolar ridge. In the case of the alveolar fricatives, the superior longitudinal muscle raises the tongue tip to the alveolar ridge to make that constriction. In the case of our interdental fricatives, the genioglossus helps advance the tongue body uh, along with posterior vertical muscles, and then the combination of both superior and inferior longitudinal muscles um, help create a, a stiffened tongue tip that can be placed between the teeth. In the case of the labiodental fricatives, the orbicularis oris and the rosorius muscle help raise the lower lip toward the upper teeth. Switching over to stop consonants and starting with articulation, we again have a constriction gesture, in this case a stop closure that depends on the place of articulation. For the velar stops, the styloglossus muscle and posterior transverse muscles will help uh, raise the tongue body up toward the uh, posterior hard palate or the soft palate. The inferior longitudinal muscle will keep the tongue tip from contacting the alveolar ridge. In the case of alveolar stops, again, the superior longitudinal muscle will be the primary articulator, raising the tongue tip up to make a closure against the alveolar ridge. In the case of bilabial stops, the orbicularis oris muscle uh, helps bring the two lips together, uh, a strong contraction to make a lip closure. And again, for both these stop consonant articulations, as well as the fricative articulations on the previous slide, there's a contribution of jaw raising where possible, um, so the jaw muscles help raise the jaw to make that uh, constriction or closure gesture more easy. For the acoustics of stop consonants, we have a closure of the vocal tract that creates a period of near silence release of that closure since the uh, respiratory expiration takes place continuously through speech, release of that closure creates a transient burst. The resonance of the vocal tract in front of that closure filters the burst. So for uh, velar stops, we get again a somewhat mid-range frequency concentration, whereas for alveolar stops we get a much higher frequency concentration. And for bilabial stops at the very front of the mouth, there is no real resonating cavity, and so the energy tends to be widespread. Voiceless stops also often have aspiration noise, so a delay between the release of the stop and the onset of the vowel following the stop. Voiced stops will not have that aspiration delay, and there also may be a voice bar that continues into the voice stop. Finally, the duration of stop closure is also affected by voicing. Stop closures are shorter for voiced stops and longer for voiceless stops. Here we have spectrograms of um, the voiceless stops flanked by ah uh, vowels. You can see in the case of each a period of near silence, followed by a transient with some aspiration noise before the onset of the following vowel. In the case of voiced stops at the same place of articulation, uh, in these recorded examples, which were probably articulated pretty clearly, you can see a voice bar continuing through the otherwise silent portion of the stop closure, and immediately after the transient, uh, continuation of voicing in the following vowel. In this spectrogram of a monosyllabic word that we saw before, there is a stop near the end as indicated by a period of near silence, transient, and then uh, finally some additional aspiration noise for this, again, pretty clearly articulated stop. There's no evidence of a voice bar ruling out the voiced stops, and there is a mid-frequency concentration of noise in the released burst 
pointing us toward the uh, voiceless alveolar stop, ka. Putting together the information about the fricative that's at the beginning of this sound and this final stop then, uh, we can actually identify this word. Starts with a sh, but ends with a k. Um, so among these choices, it must be the word shock. In the word shock, we have an a ah vowel, so we would expect a relatively high F1 and an F2 close to it, which we have, as well as a visible voice bar because of the high F1, which we also have.